Great Britain, once the dominant global power, inventor of the modern tank, builder of the world's finest World War II fighter, and ruler of the seas for centuries, may no longer command the strength it once did. Yet it continues to produce some of the world's most respected military equipment, from advanced missiles and air defense systems to tanks and some of the most capable naval platforms in history. I'm Thomas, a former officer in the Finnish Defense Forces, and in this episode, we'll list some of the best equipment that the UK produces in 2025. And as we've done with the Nordic nations and Poland, we'll rate by use, experience, and overall performance of current platforms, and then we'll move on to upcoming equipment. First, let's look at the overall export numbers. Great Britain exported around 3.6% of the total military exports in the world in 2024, and about a doubling of its export numbers for 2021 at 8.5 billion. Notable exports are Eurofighter Typhoons, anti-tank weaponry, parts for F-35s, naval armaments, and missile technology. Their biggest export market was Qatar, who bought 2.7 billion worth of mainly Eurofighter Typhoons, missiles, and support systems. If this was in the 1970s, I would probably start this episode with the Hawker Siddeley Harrier. And while a newer version of this design is used in a few navies around the world, in particular Italy and Spain, British aerospace production is not what it used to be. Though they still take large parts in both the Eurofighter and the F-35 program, British aerospace went from having around 200,000 jobs in 1970 to only around 100,000 today. Much of the job losses have come from the fact that the UK no longer completely make their own aircraft, and with the advent of joining the F-35 program, essentially exported a lot of its best aerospace jobs to mainly the US. Now, on to the actual current production. Going by the numbers, the one British export which has seen the most recent battlefield success is without a doubt the NLAW, or Next Generation Light Anti-Tank Weapon for short, which the UK co-produces with Sweden. The NLAW was one of the first weapons to be delivered in great quantity to Ukraine after Russia had invaded, and together with the Javelin and Carl Gustav became the absolute terror of Russian tankers. It is made at the Schwartz Brothers Old Factory, which is now owned by Thales in Belfast, as well as in Saab's Beaufort's factory. While not as advanced as a Javelin or Carl Gustav, its weight and fire and discard abilities makes it a favorite among special forces and reconnaissance units in the Ukrainian army. At least 5,000 NLAWs were donated to Ukraine, and they are still featuring prominently in the fight against Russia. It is currently operated by six nations, with a further two having the system on order. Judging by its recent export success, it's only natural that the second system on this list is the Sea or Land Scepter Anti-Air Defense System, together with its excellent CAMM missile. This system, which incidentally the British Army calls Sky Sabre, when combined with a giraffe radar, is currently in use on both navies and in land systems in five different nations, with the Sea Scepter being the most widely adapted. Britain appears to have made a very capable alternative to the American Sea Sparrow and ESSM system. MDBA, who will feature prominently in this list, appears to be winning bids left, right and center with this system and will likely see many more sales in the short term. While some argue that tanks are becoming obsolete in modern warfare, the British Challenger platform continues to prove otherwise. The Challenger 2, already renowned for its survivability and protection, is currently being upgraded to the Challenger 3 standard. And based on everything we've seen so far, it will remain one of the most solid and respected main battle tanks in service for years to come. As we discussed in one of our recent videos on tanks, which I'll leave in the description, in Ukraine, the few Challenger 2 tanks delivered to the front lines have taken direct hits from heavy Russian fire, including artillery, anti-tank weapons, and FPV drones, as seen in this video, and survived at rates that outperform many of their counterparts. This combat performance underscores just how well-engineered the platform is, in particular in regards to its armor. The Challenger 3 upgrade brings the system fully into the next generation. It includes advanced digital fire control, new electronics, an improved turret, and a NATO standard 120mm smoothbore gun, 
making it interoperable with allies. Perhaps most importantly, it will be equipped with an active protection system capable of intercepting modern threats like loitering munitions and FPV drones, a necessity on today's battlefield. Perhaps showing that the future of Europe's fighter programs can have success, the Eurofighter Typhoon stands as a testament to the United Kingdom's advanced aerospace engineering. As a key partner in the Eurofighter Consortium, the UK holds a 37.5% production share in the Typhoon program, with BAE Systems leading the assembly of the front fuselage, cockpit and tail sections at its Wharton facility in Lancashire. Rolls-Royce contributes by manufacturing the EJ200 engines, further solidifying the UK's integral role in the aircraft's development. In terms of performance, the Typhoon excels with a top speed of Mach 2.35 and an impressive climb rate, making it ideal for quick reaction alert missions. Its agility and speed surpass those of the F-35, particularly at mid to high altitudes, and although it lacks the F-35's stealth capabilities, it is known to have a much higher rate of readiness than the F-35, which still struggles with being kept in the air at rates above 30%. Cost-wise, the Typhoon is competitively priced. For export customers, the unit cost is approximately £70 million, while partner nations benefit from lower procurement costs, sometimes as low as €50 million Euros per unit. Additionally, the Typhoon boasts lower maintenance expenses, averaging around 15 to US$20,000 per flight hour, compared to the F-35's costs, which can exceed 40000 per hour. Staying in the air, the UK maintains a strategically vital helicopter manufacturing sector centered in Yeovil, Somerset, home to the country's only major rotary wing production line. This facility, now operated by Leonardo Helicopters, was originally part of Westland Helicopters, a historic British aerospace firm that merged with Italy's Augusta to form Augusta Westland, before eventually being acquired by Leonardo in 2016. Despite the foreign ownership, the Yeovil site remains a cornerstone of UK defence manufacturing. One of its Yeovil factory's flagship products is the AW159 Wildcat, a highly versatile helicopter used by both the British Army and Royal Navy for reconnaissance, utility and anti-submarine missions. The Wildcat has proven especially effective in maritime roles, equipped with advanced avionics and capable of deploying Martlet and Sea Venom missiles. The AW101 Merlin, also built in Yeovil, is another core asset serving in transport, anti-submarine, and search and rescue roles. Its continued relevance was reinforced by a recent £165 million maintenance contract extension with the UK government. After years of delays, technical setbacks, and cost overruns, the British Army's Ajax Armoured Fighting Vehicle has finally begun deliveries, marking a significant milestone in the UK's largest armoured vehicle programme in decades. Although owned by US-based General Dynamics, the Ajax is designed and assembled in the UK, with production centred at General Dynamics UK's facility in, pardon my Welsh, Merthyr Tydfil, Wales. Approximately 80% of the manufacturing work is conducted domestically, supporting around 4,100 jobs across 230 UK-based suppliers. Notably, the Ajax platform has garnered international attention with General Dynamics Land Systems proposing a variant based on the Ajax family for the US Army's optionally manned fighting vehicle program, aimed at replacing the aging M2 Bradley. This consideration underscores the Ajax's potential as a next-generation IFV on the global stage. I have to admit, it's hard to understand why the British government chose an American design platform, especially when BAE, a British company, builds the CV-90 in Sweden which is arguably the most successful IFV in Europe and could quite easily also be built in the UK. Still, I'm sure there were various factors considered during the bidding process. Before we close out the armoured vehicle segment, I want to give a proper shout out to the Warrior. Of all the platforms we've come across, it's probably had the biggest impact on the team behind this channel. It saved the behind of our resident Swede in Bosnia, backed up my Finnish squad in Afghanistan and still serves with distinction in the Baltic NATO presence, where our Danish teammate is deployed today. 
It's been in service with the British Army since 1988, and in our view, it still holds up as a rock-solid fighting vehicle. I expect many will be handed over to Ukraine as Ajax takes over, but to us, the warrior will always be one of the greats. No overview of British military technology is complete without acknowledging its cutting-edge missile systems, which have become essential to both domestic defense and the export market. While we already mentioned CAM earlier in this episode, the UK still has a lot more to offer. The first on the list without a doubt must be Storm Shadow. Developed collaboratively by the UK and France, the Storm Shadow is a long-range, air-launched cruise missile designed for precision strikes against high-value targets. With a range exceeding 250 kilometers, it employs a combination of GPS, inertial navigation, and terrain-referenced navigation systems to achieve pinpoint accuracy. Its stealthy design and low-altitude flight path make it challenging to detect and intercept. The missile's broach warhead is specifically engineered to penetrate hardened structures, making it effective against bunkers and fortified positions. Storm Shadow has been operationally deployed in various conflicts, including Iraq, Libya and Syria, and has recently been supplied to Ukraine, where it has been used to target Russian military assets, including famously taking out the Black Sea Fleet's headquarters in Sevastopol, as well as several hardened structures housing important personnel. Secondly, the Brimstone missile is a precision-guided, air-to-surface weapon known for its accuracy and versatility. Utilizing millimeter wave radar and semi-active laser guidance, Brimstone can engage both stationary and moving targets with minimal collateral damage. It has been integrated onto various platforms, including fast jets, helicopters, and unmanned aerial vehicles, as well as jeeps and other vehicles in Ukraine to devastating effect. Now, I could likely mention the Meteor or the Spear 3 here too, but there's only so many missile systems we can all take, onto naval vessels. While Britain's two aircraft carriers have had a bit of a rough start to their life, it would be amiss of me not to mention them first in the naval category. The Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers, comprising HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales, are the largest warships ever built for the Royal Navy, each displacing approximately 65,000 tons. Designed to project air power globally, these carriers can deploy up to 40 aircraft, including the F-35, helicopters and drones. The Daring-class destroyers are widely regarded as some of the most advanced air defense warships afloat, with six in service, including HMS Daring, Defender and Diamond, they form the protective shield around carrier groups and expeditionary forces. Their key feature is the Sea Viper missile system, coupled with the cutting-edge Samson radar, which allows them to track and engage multiple airborne threats simultaneously, including supersonic missiles and hostile aircraft. They've proven their value in high-threat deployments across the Gulf, Mediterranean and Indo-Pacific regions. Lastly, in the operational sense, the astute-class nuclear-powered submarines are the backbone of the Royal Navy's hunter-killer fleet. With five in active service and more on the way, these boats are among the stealthiest and most sophisticated attack submarines in the world. Built in Barrow in Furness, the astutes carry Tomahawk cruise missiles for land attack roles and spearfish torpedoes for anti-ship and anti-submarine warfare. They've conducted long-range patrols, intelligence gathering, and strategic presence missions, often without making headlines, thanks to their extreme discretion and endurance. Each astute can stay submerged for months at a time, limited only by food supply and crew endurance. When it comes to emerging military technology, I could probably go on for hours. The UK has a long tradition of pushing the envelope across multiple domains, from aerospace to air defense and directed energy weapons, and the current wave of innovation is no exception. In January 2024, Dragonfire achieved the UK's first high-power firing of a laser weapon against aerial targets during trials at the MOD's Hebrides range. The system delivers a high-power laser over long ranges with pinpoint accuracy, capable of engaging visible targets at line-of-sight distances. The cost per shot is significantly lower than traditional missile systems, with estimates around £10 per firing. The Royal Navy plans to install Dragonfire aboard warships by 2027 to enhance defense against airborne threats, 
Rumors have this system already performing trials in Ukraine, though I'm not sure if this is the case. Now, on to something which I don't have a video of as it is so new and secret. Gravehawk is a British short-range air defense system developed primarily for the armed forces of Ukraine during the ongoing conflict. Designed to counter drones and other low to medium altitude threats, it repurposes existing cheap Soviet R-73 short-range air-to-air missiles for ground-based launch. The system is containerized for rapid deployment and concealment, utilizing a twin-arm missile launcher and an electro-optical and infrared targeting camera, operated remotely by a crew of five. Developed over 18 months by Team Kindred, a collaboration between the UK Ministry of Defense and industry partners, with funding also provided by Denmark, the system has proven effective in field tests. To wrap it all up, whether it's legacy platforms like the Warrior, cutting-edge systems like Dragonfire, or the sheer presence of the Queen Elizabeth-class carriers, the UK remains a serious player in defense manufacturing. While there are challenges, especially around procurement and political priorities, it's clear that British industry continues to produce systems that are respected, exported, and deployed globally. If you're curious about how all of this ties into the bigger picture, particularly when it comes to alliances like AUKUS, make sure to check out our latest episode, released today, where we dive into the growing tensions surrounding the UK and Australia's relationship with Donald Trump's United States. You'll find the link in both the description and the comments. As always, have a great weekend.